Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome back to the Doha Debates sponsored by the Qatar Foundation. This is the start of our second series here in the Gulf and we're determined to keep up the pressure. Pressure for tough, open analysis of controversial issues. Pressure on our speakers and on you, the audience, to come up with new arguments and new thinking. Tonight, the motion goes to the heart of some of the bitterest sentiments in the Arab world. This House believes that Arab governments have failed the Palestinians. Well, whichever way you vote, we hope this will serve as a catalyst for some lively debate about one of the most divisive issues in the region, who helped the Palestinians, who stood in their way, and did the Palestinians ever really help themselves? Let's see if we can sift some of the truth from the volumes of fiction. Four speakers tonight, all with instructions to be brief but persuasive. Speaking for the motion, Hussein Ibish is a senior fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine, a frequent writer and broadcaster on Middle Eastern affairs. He co-authored the book entitled The Palestinian's Right of Return. Born in Beirut, he now holds both U.S. and Lebanese citizenship. Gada Kami is a research fellow at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at Exeter University in England. Based now in Ramallah, she is also an information advisor to the Palestinian Authority. She's found time in her busy life to qualify as a doctor of medicine and contributes regularly to a number of journals and newspapers. Now against the motion, Ahmed Maher, a career diplomat who chose to retire after a long and distinguished career but was made an offer he couldn't refuse and became Egypt's 71st foreign minister, a post he held until he really did retire last year. Well, three years ago, during an interview on Iraq, I accused him of sitting on the fence. He replied disarmingly, but we're all sitting on the fence. Not tonight, though, I'm sure. <laughs> and Michael Tarazi, he's a Palestinian lawyer, now advising the Palestinian Authority's Ministry for Jerusalem Affairs. He's previously served with the PLO Negotiations Affairs Department. Hard to know that whether that was more or less challenging than his time practicing securities law in New York. Suffice it to say that he's used to a variety of different pressures. A great qualification to sit here as the fourth member of our panel. Now let me call on Hussein Ibish to begin by speaking for the motion. Thank you very much, Tim. I'd like to start by inviting all of you in the audience to join me in a thought experiment. Right? Let's look at the present situation of the Palestinians, and let's say, for the sake of argument, that this does not constitute somehow failure. Right? Let's not call it success. All right? Let's call it something like neutral, maybe. And then let's extrapolate in our imaginations a downward spiral in the direction of failure. Now, can you imagine what failure would then look like? Neither can I. I mean, how much worse would things have to get before we could say to ourselves, Arabs, your governments have failed the Palestinians? Of course Arab governments have failed the Palestinians. Of course they have. Across the Arab world, while the Palestinian issue has often been used uh, cynically by governments as a rallying cry, a diversion, and an excuse for internal repression, Palestinians themselves have all too often been feared, at times hated, and sometimes even persecuted by Arab regimes. The outrageous and shameful behavior of the government of Lebanon, uh, my home country, towards its own Palestinian refugee population would probably be Exhibit A, excluded as they are from so many professions, hemmed into some of the most wretched refugee camps in the entire world. Uh, there are many other key examples, of course, including the expulsion of Palestinians from Libya and Kuwait. One could go on and on. I, I doubt anyone in this audience is unaware of, the, of this sorry record. It's a sad but true commentary and one that we need to face up to that Palestinians living in my adopted country, the United States, have more rights than they do in any Arab state. Three quick provisos on this. First, <clears throat> no doubt, Arabs generally as individuals and, and as societies have cared deeply about the Palestinians and have done much to help them. Second, most of the blame, no doubt, for the terrible situation of, and suffering of the Palestinians belongs at the feet of their main persecutors, the state of Israel. 
Uh, thirdly, the international community led by the United States has also failed the Palestinian people, as has uh, the historically poor, if not at times wretched, leadership of the Palestinian national movement. But this debate isn't about any of those actors or any of those things. We are here to discuss the spectacular failure of the Arab governments towards the Palestinians. Hossein Ibish, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tim. The Arab governments launched five wars against yes. Israel on behalf of the Palestinians. In is that, the distant that, past. That, that not good enough for you? Uh, in the distant past. Well, they shed a lot of blood, didn't they? Uh, yes, and certainly that's uh, among the things that I meant when I said individual Palestinians, uh, individual Arabs had suffered. For Palestinians, many had fought in, in the distant past. In Not fought because their governments the went to war but with Israel. It doesn't constitute success. Right. Fighting, but you can't blame them. You can't criticize them for not wars, trying. Well, it depends. I mean, I would argue that the intervention in 1948 was too little too late, and that in 1973, countries like Egypt were, were fighting to recover uh, their own territory, and they were satisfied they'd achieved success because they ended up on the other side of the Suez Canal. And when they couldn't achieve their own particular national aims, which everyone should and could respect, which have to do with, with regaining their territorial integrity through war, they did it through negotiations. But had they succeeded? The Palestinians, the Palestinians would have been the main beneficiaries, wouldn't they? In Palestinians 19, would have been the main beneficiaries. Yes, I don't know about 1973 because it was about re regaining occupied national land of, of sovereign states. It's certainly possible. This is a counterfactual argument. It doesn't go to uh, to to demonstrate in any way that Arab states have succeeded the Palestinian the support. Have, they may not have Palestine. succeeded, but they tried. The issue is kept alive at every major well, forum. The Arab League. Question. Can I just finish? Can yes, I just finish can. the question before you give me an answer? All right. Um, they try at every major forum to bring up the issue yeah. of the Palestinians. It's raised by the Arab League. Right. It's raised by Arab governments. Right. It's not forgotten. It's continually yeah. used as a lever. And that, too, ah. isn't good enough for you. But that, uh, right, because what I think is that it's being used rhetorically for uh, often cynical political reasons, as I say, often domestic reasons, often regional reasons. But I think that for the most part, certainly since 1973, Palestinians have been left to face the Israelis on their own. And Arab state after Arab state has developed their own pragmatic policies towards the Israelis and I believe that given the rhetoric prevalent in uh, the there Arab world from peace regimes, treaties. Oh, there no, are from, only two from, peace treaties, you know, aren't there? There's a lot more to dealing with the Israelis than making a fully-fledged peace treaty. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You, Ahmed Maher, can I ask you to speak against the motion, please? Thank you, Tim, for having tried to get us out of a world of fantasy because uh, what I heard is a lot of fantasy, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, innuendos, and uh, what one gets from this uh, spe speech is that the Palestinians are not players in this game. They're pawns of countries that are using them, and they have no cause to defend for themselves. I believe this to be absolutely wrong. The, the question is, I think it was said that Israel is still there. It is still there, and it is still going to be there. But the failure is the failure of the world to support the Palestinian cause. What the Arab countries did was fight at the United Nations for the Palestinian cause, fight on the terrain for the Palestinian cause, fight diplomatically, fight through political action. I think the Arabs did a lot that they, were, they had to do, but the world failed the Arabs and failed the Palestinians. If you speak about Egypt, and I think Camp David was mentioned, 73 was mentioned, we fought in 73, to recuperate all Arab territories, starting by Egyptian territory, because it was believed, and I think it is true, that a stronger Egypt would be in a stronger position to help the Palestinians. Because we believe, and the Arab countries believe, that their national security is linked to the Palestinian question. We believe that without the solution of the Palestinian question on the basis of uh, uh, justice, uh, there would be no stability in the region. There would always be uh, a situation very difficult for everybody. And that is why in 73, I was there at Camp David when we were talking not only about the recuperation of the Egyptian territory, but also about the Palestinian problem. And we came out with two documents, one concerning Egypt and one concerning the negotiations for the Palestinian question. It is true that this was not accepted at the time by the Palestinians, but it did not prevent us to get into very thorough and difficult negotiations in order to get the Israelis to recognize 
the existence of the Palestinian problem, the existence of the Palestinian people. And if there has been a recognition later on of the PLO, of the uh, Palestinian Authority by Israel, it is in fact due to efforts by Egypt, to the steps that Egypt has taken. What we see now is the situation where uh, we have tried everything we could, and I think uh, what remains to be seen is how the world reacts to the attitudes of the Israelis and support also the Palestinian people, which is a moral obligation as much as a political obligation. Ahmed Maher, thank you very much indeed. If, if as you say, you did all you could, why did Egypt pass a series over the years of restrictive laws against the Palestinians about their right to return to the country, travel documents which insisted that they get visas outside the country before they were allowed back in, restrictions on the students, uh, the kind of education they could have and the jobs they could have? Why, why so many restrictions on the Palestinians uh, if you were playing the role of friendly uncle? Let me tell you that uh, the number of Palestinians working in Egypt and studying in Egypt, having studied in Egypt, is enormous. There were some restrictions, but one of the main reasons why? of there, this... There were a lot I, of I restrictions. Why. There were a lot of restrictions. I, I tell you why. This was, a position, some, but a this was a position of all the Arab countries. They did not want the Palestinians to leave Palestine because this would, in fact, evacuate the whole problem. If you allowed the Palestinians to go all over the world, this would mean that the Israelis would have achieved their goal of putting an end to the existence of the Palestinian people on the Palestinian But once territory. they're there, is that a reason to mistreat them or not no, to give them equal no, rights? There was no mistreatment. There were some regulations. But I still tell you that the numbers of Palestinians who are working in Egypt today, who have been working in Egypt for the last years, 20, 30, 40 years, the number of students who came to study in Egypt, in Egypt and who are studying in Egypt is by the thousand. All right. Ahmed Maher, thank you very much indeed. Let me call on Kada Kami to speak for the motion, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I speak with a heavy heart because as an Arab, I should not attack fellow Arabs. But it is not the Arab people who have always, who has always supported the Palestinians that I mean. It is their governments who so often do not represent them. What I say will earn me no favors with Arab governments, but I believe that if we are to progress, we Arabs must not be afraid to be self-critical and to face our faults honestly. Yes, the Arab governments have failed the Palestinians. Now, the other side argues, and I knew it would, that they've helped them a lot. We don't deny that. They did help. They've given them funding, they've given them help, the sort of thing you've heard about. Uh, Jordan gave them citizenship, uh, and so on. But look closer. The Arab states never succeeded in defeating Israel. In 1978, which His Excellency has referred to, Egypt, the only state which could have left the battlefront with the Camp David Treaty. Since then, the rest have been trying to make peace with Israel, a state that occupies Arab land and kills Arabs. Today, they are falling over themselves to recognize Israel. Why? Because Israel vacated a few settlements which were illegal anyway. And look what we're reduced to. Egypt, that great power, is now Israel's policeman on Gaza's border. And the rest watch helplessly while Israel kills and bombs the Palestinians and steals their land, and Israel's best friend, America, lays waste to that great country, Iraq. I am not unsympathetic to the Arab government's dilemma. They owe their support, and in many cases, their very existence to American favor. America is Israel's greatest ally. So, if they fight Israel, they risk losing American support and threaten their own survival. It is an unenviable position. But no matter what the cause for the Palestinians, it comes down to the same thing. The Arab governments have failed them. So, I urge you tonight to vote with your consciences. You know that I'm saying what most of you think but do not say. I urge you, vote 
on the side of truth and honesty vote to support our motion. Kadakami, thank you very much indeed. Since we're talking about truth and you want to be self-critical, um, perhaps one of the reasons that the Arab governments have not supported uh, the Palestinians as much as you like because perhaps the Palestinians have failed the Arab governments or at least the Palestinian governments have failed the Arabs. Look, the, we, we're not talking about the, the, the Palestinian failure. Of course there are Palestinian mistakes uh, right from the 1950s. Mistakes? Spectacular corruption? Nepotism? Who's defending corruption? All I'm saying, don't call it spectacular. Please look at the state of the Arab Hundreds world. Hundreds of millions look of dollars is not spectacular. Look you wanted to be self-critical and open. Okay. We are not discussing whether the Palestinians themselves could have done better. They could, but that's not our motion. The motion tonight is, did the Arab govern governments fail them? And well, you're I've saying just they failed, and I'm saying did. that perhaps it, the, the Palestinians failed the Arab governments. Do you mean perhaps they didn't want to support a regime that was as corrupt and nepotistic as the one they had to deal with over many years. But the Palestinians that's what some of them say. But they didn't have a regime for, for decades, and they did not receive the support. Yes, they Arafat needed. wasn't their leader. Leader in control yes, of their Sir, funds? Arafat indeed was their leader. Exactly. But it, it, he was their leader, but what? Look. In control of the purse strings or not? In control of the purse strings. But this is not about Palestinian corruption or not. This is about It's about whether. the attitude of the Arab, Arab governments no, to the Palestinians. No, it's You're about, saying they failed. Them. It's about I'm Arab telling, telling you why, they may, why the Palestinians may have it, failed the Arabs. It's about Arab government performance with the Palestinian cause. And the Palestinian cause isn't just Yasser Arafat and a few corrupt ministers. It isn't. It is not, of course not. It's a world cause. Gada you know Kami. very well what it is. Thank you very much indeed. Michael Tarazi, let me ask you to speak against the motion, please. Uh, I, I have to admit that when I, when I first heard the motion tonight, I thought to myself, well, how can you have a debate? I mean, everybody knows the Palestinians have been failed by the Arab governments. What's anyone going to say? And then I started thinking about it, and I thought to myself, this is actually making me angry, because not only is it false, but it actually imposes a double standard on the Arab governments. Why does this resolution focus on Arab governments? I mean, we all know that it's the international community as a whole that has failed the Palestinians. And yet, this resolution focuses on the Arab governments. Why? Because there's an unstated but understood assumption behind the question that all we brown people in the Middle East should have a tribal allegiance to each other that supersedes the obligations of the international community. That's simply not true. It is not the responsibility of the Arab governments alone to enforce international law against Israel. That is the obligation of practically every member of the United Nations. So why are we focusing on the Arabs? Let's focus a little bit on history. It wasn't the Arabs that gave away Palestine to the Zionists, was it? No, that was Britain. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm not a representative it of any government. The, it wasn't the Arabs who helped nor Israel. I were you. It but wasn't you the are. Arabs who helped develop Israel's nuclear technology. That was France. It's not the Arabs that give Israel billions of dollars a year to help uh, violate the rights of Palestinians and to build illegal settlements. That's the United States. And here we are blaming the Arabs. Why do we fall into this double standard and self-flagellate and say this is all our fault? To vote for this resolution is the equivalent of voting for a resolution that says Arabs have an obligation to clean up a mess they didn't create that they didn't want, that they don't exacerbate, and over which they have very little authority. Why would we take on that obligation when it's not our fault? Michael Tarazi, thank you very much indeed. Hussein Ibish. Yeah. Hussein Ibish, I'm going to bring you in in a little while. Okay. Bring in Hussein Ibish, and I'm going to bring the audience sure. in in a little while as well. Right. Um, you posed the question, why focus on the Arabs? because the Arabs mm. focus on the Palestinians the whole time. They raise it at every that's possible right. opportunity. They do, and that's they a demonstration... Large, they pledge large sums of money, and, and only one of them gives it. You're right, and they Saudi raise Arabia. the issue... So they right. don't live up to their promises to they, the Palestinians, They do raise they? the issue, which is a hell of a lot more than the rest of the international community does. And they don't does. live up to and their pledges, And that's proof of the fact they? that they actually do help the Palestinians more than everybody else. They don't else. live up to their pledges. They don't help them more. In 2004, the World right. Bank Trust gave budget support grants of $118 million. The EU gave 50 million, the US 20 million. Only one Arab 
country lived up to its Tim, pledge. Do you think helping the Palestinians is throwing money at them so they feel more comfortable under occupation? Do you think helping, or do you is think helping, helping, helping the Palestinians, Palestinians ending not, the occupation? Do you think helping the Palestinians the is not giving them the money that you pledged my them? Goal is, is, a that, my, is that good help? My goal as a Palestinian is not to live comfortably under occupation. My goal Nobody is to was end suggesting. that occupation. Wouldn't you like the money that was pledged? What, how dare you treat me as if I just want money? I want my freedom. Wouldn't you like Where the is money your contribution for the freedom? Who pays the salary of the Palestinian Authority? I'm getting paid by the Norwegians. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's my point. Yeah. The, so, reason, the reason the, the Arabs focus and on it is because they raise it so at every conceivable opportunity. So you're saying the Arabs have failed the Palestinian people because they don't pay Michael Tarazi's salary. Well, that's great. Thank you, Tim. And they don't give you the kinds of conditions to work the in the other Arab countries, in Lebanon, for instance, our, which you Hussein know what? Ibish and talked about. And I'm surprised you, the ambassador didn't say this, You don't speak out about that. Actually. Why not? Well, you know what? Because that's not my goal. I was born in Kuwait, and you Kuwait treated me very... You don't care about the conditions no. of Palestinians in other I, Arab countries. I was born in an Arab country, and I am very grateful to Kuwait for giving me an opportunity that nobody other, no other country did. We did and very well in Kuwait. So I'm all right, Jack, and I don't care no, about the refugee I'm, camps in Lebanon. I'm an example of the fact that not everyone's in a refugee camp in Lebanon, so why but do we focus on what about those who are? Look, no interest to you whatsoever. Of course no. there's an interest, but our goal is not to be integrated into Arab countries. Our goal is to liberate our own country. And with that or regard, the Arabs have helped. from him. Arab countries. You don't even mind about the mistreatment from Arab countries. We're mistreated countries. not just in Arab countries. Have you looked at the United States no, past September 11th? we're talking about the Arab countries here. Why? We're about That's the Arab my whole question. Here. Why do you keep focusing because on the Arabs? Because they raise the issue of the Palestinians continually. Thankfully. And that's actually evidence you of the fact that they do ways. help You can't have it both ways. You're arguing from one side and from the other. You no, want your cake and eat it. Of course I can have it both ways. They you don't care about the Palestinians, the refugee camps, have no cake. actually do. Well, you know what? It's like America's opening its doors to us. Why don't you blame them? Michael Tarazi, thank you very much. Hossein Ibish, you well, want to come you, in here, yeah, and then I'm going to take some questions. No, you, you got him in that huge contr contradiction. But, I mean, what I want to point out is that uh, Michael's statement actually made our case for us perfectly. He said, and they fought wars. They failed, but they fought wars. Then they, they failed, but they did. then they put a diplomatic resolution. It felt, you, you know, there's a, a kind of punctuation in your entire speech that came back to recognizing the truth of the proposition on the table, which is that Arab states, have they tried things? Yes. Are we saying they've done nothing at all? No, we're not. What we're saying is, have they failed? Yes. Gentleman on the right there. Yes, uh, my question is from Mr. Tarazi. Why won't rich Arab countries help uh, Palestinian refugees financially? Why are they living in such bad conditions? Well, they are actually helping. I mean, the United Arab Emirates, I think, is spending $100 million in Gaza to recreate an entire city for housing for Palestinian refugees in Gaza. So I don't know what the basis of your question is. $100 million? Is. Um, I think it's approximately $100 million. $100 million. Perhaps less, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know the exact amount, but it's a lot of money. Million. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. They're spending a lot. They're spending more than a million, let's say. I mean, they're spending money or on... Why are I, they I thought it was a lot of money, but... Billions. We need billions. Who's we? Are you Palestinian we, I'm say, No, I'm saying in order to achieve the result that we all so, agree on. But I don't know the base of your question. They are actually bringing... I mean, what do you want me to do? Because I'm not a Palestinian walk away from this issue? No, but you said what? we. I don't know who's exactly. we. We need we, billions. Who's we? We, the people of goodwill <laughs> in this world, the intelligent, reasonable people of the world. I would agree with Mr. Ibish's description of what the role of the Arab countries should be. Helping the Palestinians realize the conditions to create their own state. This is exactly what yeah. we've been trying to do. Yeah. That is why it is preposterous to hear somebody say that Egypt, Egypt is playing the role of policeman to the Israelis. This is utter nonsense. I mean, what we are what trying to do, what we are trying to do is help the Palestinians in Gaza build their authority and reaffirm the authority of the national Palestinian um, no, what, we have to, why is the Egyptian army We are not playing the, the role of policemen. This is not only outrageous, it is preposterous. But it you is don't not true. police any We are not normally. playing the role. We are sitting on the borders between Palestinians and Egyptians. But why no are Israelis you are involved in this thing. On the border? We right. are it's helping the if Palestinians. Only, we if, have if the right not, to defend our borders. No, I mean, this is very from clear. Whom? So from don't whom? any border. From I mean, the borders the with any country, you defend them. From the Palestinians? Aren't you responsible for you the borders actually, of your country with any other country? So I, I, would, I would ask you, you I would ask you not to say preposterous to actually things. Do because this is preposterous. insulting. This is not true. And let me see it from the audience. Lady in the fourth row there, please. Um, my question is directed to the people for the motion. You say that the Arab governments have failed them, but maybe the Palestinians are asking too much. 
of the Arab governments. Got a comment. Would you yeah. like to answer I, that? I understand that question, mm -hmm. you know, because I actually referred to it in my statement. Yes, I think it is, it may, it may be asking too much of them for the reason that I tried to say, which is that the Arab governments are caught in a trap. They depend on American favor. I cannot stress this too much. And if they challenge Israel and really fight Israel, which is what we need. We don't need money. We need somebody to fight our enemy, to help us. They can't fight Israel because they know that they will incur American anger and they cannot afford to do that. Are you yes, happy with so that in answer? that sense, you're right. Are you happy with that answer? You please stand up. Please, please stand up. Are you happy with that answer? But maybe you're asking the Arab governments to risk too much, to risk relations with other countries maybe, for the Palestinians. But uh, I, 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 you, you expect the Arab governments to be more pro-Palestinian than the Palestinians, basically. You're not going to be no, happy to no, the entire no, Middle East is occupied. Can, can I answer the question from the floor, please? The Lebanese state, to treat the Palestinians living in Lebanon as full human beings, that is not asking too much. That's the question. That is not, the question, that, no, that, no, the question no, no, I can to, express our own question. It goes to the question. What? what it goes to the question. question. Look, she asked me the question. Are we asking too much? She asked me, are we asking too much? I gave her a very honest answer because we on this side are actually speaking very honestly. We're not playing games. And let me say, we're not... No, and let me say we're not in full agreement here. I, I really, I take a slightly different view than Rada does. I want, I want two things that are not asking too much and that are not going to bring Arab states in, into conflict with the United States. One is treat the Palestinians who live in your countries decently. That the United States is not going to object to. It will have no problem if Lebanon stops abusing Palestinians in Lebanon and restricting them and keeping them in these miserable conditions. Number two, help the Palestinians to develop a plausible, serious, realistic national strategy for liberation that involves the full complexity and move away from this re horrible rhetoric about steadfastness and martyrdom, okay. this right. nationalistic well, uh, okay. That's, rubbish. That's, we've, we've covered that in a sense. Uh, I yeah. mean, this is past history. I mean, what oh, we're trying no, to do Don't you is read the they paper? Help to help Palestinians uh, in the negotiating process to regain their, their rights. All right. I mean, you, what you, he's you, talking about is old history. You made that oh, oh, lady, oh, in the, lady in the first row, oh, please. Dear. Can we take your question? Please. Can we get a microphone to you? Thank you. Please stand up, will you? Okay. Dr. Abish, since I am Lebanese and I am one that uh, supports the Palestinian cause, but you mentioned four or five times about uh, the abusing of the Palestinian yes. in Lebanon. Yes, it is a shameful point. But you never mentioned that Lebanon was support the Lebanese was supporting the Palestinian cause. Lebanon was a battlefield for the Palestinian, for the resistance. Oh, yes, we I paid, did. no, Lebanon had paid. Yes. And I think we oh, are yes, still paying for but the yes, Palestinian. Yes, I did mention it. I would agree with you. The Lebanese have paid a heavy price. More, actually, let me say that the, the uh, integrity and the future of the Lebanese state has been called into question on a number of occasions. Uh, so it, the Lebanese have played a very high price much more than most of the Arab societies. At the same time, the treatment of the Palestinians in Lebanon has been pretty, both are true. Eddie in the front row. Um, Sir Ahmed, after all this peace uh, agreement and Camp David negotiations, uh, and uh, Egypt have uh, a very long history with Israel, how can you define very clearly your relation, I mean the uh, Egyptian government relation with Israel now, and how does this relation help the Palestinian? I think our relations with Israel are relations that are geared in particular to helping solving the Palestinian problem. There is no country that has been more involved in attempts to solve the Palestinian problem. And what we are trying to do now is help the Palestinians recuperate their land. It is not by uh, criticizing the policies of Egypt that you will achieve what the Palestinians want, because in fact, the Palestinian Authority, which is representative of the Palestinian people, appreciates the efforts of Egypt, supports the efforts of Egypt, and the impediment to an agreement is Israel. So our friends here should address the position of Israel and those who support Israel, not those who are trying to help the Palestinians, have achieved results for the Palestinians, will continue to achieve results for the Palestinians. I'm very astonished at a position taken that pretends not to recognize all the efforts that Egypt has achieved, that Arab countries have been exerting, and the real impediment is those who do not recognize these efforts and try to uh, make it appear 
as if the Arab countries are not trying to help the Palestinian cause. This is against the position of the Palestinian authority. Let me just return to the question for a moment. No, I mean, they are more Palestinians than the Palestinian Authority itself. It is an amazing situation. Can I ask if you were happy with that answer? Do you accept what Ahmed Maher has said? Actually, um, actually um, I'm really totally, I agree with you, but I don't think the Egyptian government did the best they could. I mean, they can do a lot much better than they did. Like what? Yeah. Can you, I mean, I'm just kind of curious, as a Palestinian, I, I'm always wondering, we always criticize, but what more do we want the Arabs to do that they haven't already tried? Actually, actually, no, can, let's, I let's just answer. No, let her answer, please. Actually, uh, sir, uh, we know that uh, Egypt, um, you know, and Israel have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, what can I say, um, you know, a relation, but, you know, it's like behind the scenes. Like, you, you announce something in the media and you do another thing. There are no relations behind the scene between Egypt and Israel. Our position is very clear. It is known to the Palestinians, and the Palestinians are very grateful for the efforts that we are exerting. Yeah. So don't, if you if listen... If, if you don't have the relations... It would be one of the few times in history that if, countries if didn't have, have backdoor the, relations, wouldn't it? Yeah, if what? you don't have behind-the-scene relations, you don't have a diplomatic yeah. corps. I mean, yeah. you, you're paying people for doing nothing. You, you know, I, I mean, tell you... On. Excuse me? No, if you don't have behind the, if you don't have back-channel diplomacy going on, you don't have very good diplomats. Got to come. You yeah. wanted to make a good diplomats. We are exerting every effort to help the Palestinians. And if the Palestinians themselves... Could the men see... To the woman yeah. I agree on the, you're on good the panel, please. Okay. Yeah, Look, I can't, be, listen, I can't believe I'm hearing this. This lady's question is excellent. Do you know that before I came here tonight, do you know what's happening in Gaza? Have you looked at your televisions? Yep. Do you know how the Israelis are bombing the hell out of Gaza? Why does Egypt maintain relations with a state that does this to the Palestinians? These relations have been helpful to the Palestinians all along. They Why allowed us to play a positive them? role. Why I mean, it is very show? easy to say what you say. Yeah. Why and don't let you, the Palestinians she be bombed. You, could, could, could not she asked you, once, she please. asked you what Egypt could do. One thing it could do is show that it does not agree with the way Palestine, with the way Israel behaves, at the very least, by breaking off relations. No, it's no, never it's not a question of breaking off relations. It's, it's These it's relations have been used that. to serve the Palestinian cause. And don't be... I mean, demagogic by saying these things. You know that this relation is, is helping the Palestinians. We're trying to helping promote them. the cause of the Palestinians. And it is very Israel? easy for you to, to be here and say these, these things but that are not true. You know, I, I, would, I, would, I would say, yeah, me, to some extent Michael there's some truth in what you're saying. I, 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 I have, have to take it to So please tell that. your colleague. No, well, well, could we just have one speaker at a time, yeah, please? Okay. No, no, no. She I tells have, me. I, have to, just, <laughs> I really have to take please. exception to this idea because it's a throwback to the 1960s. What do you, you want them to isolate Israel again. That didn't help us, Ghada. It didn't help us. So let's start thinking in a different way. And secondly, the Palestinians have relations with Israel. And this is another typical example of how you are blaming Arabs because they're not more pro-Palestinian than the Palestinian official policy itself, and that is ungrateful and wrong. Allow me to, I need to clear this once and for all. I need to clarify this, because you're going to hear this many Last times. Last point on this question. Last the point. Palestinians are obliged to treat with Israel because they are no, occupied by no, it. No, we're not. The others we can are refuse not to negotiate. obliged to do this. No. And Egypt, which is a great country, is not obliged no. to maintain... Sounds there's quite a, quite a lot of division in the Palestinian Authority, isn't it, between two that advisors. I say <laughs> that <laughs> Egypt is helping the no. Palestinians much more than what you are saying. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. Lady in the centre, please. Yes, you. Could you, could you stand up, please? All right. Um, I want to ask, Mr. Michael Tarazi said that expecting the Arab governments to help Palestinians is like expecting them to clear up a mess they haven't started. But then why is it that Arab countries like Kuwait choose to support the U.S. in the Hurricane Katrina, a mess they haven't started, and not help the Palestinians? That's a question for me, right? Yes. yes. No, I agree. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, as human beings, do this. My problem is simply that we shouldn't impose upon these people a greater standard for involvement than we would to non-Arabs as well. Because in my view, this is a human disaster, not an Arab disaster, and we should all as humans be concerned about this. But I'm not saying we, they shouldn't help using Hurricane the mountain, Katrina. The mountaineers of, of, yeah. of Bolivia so have I, the same interest as, yeah. as people from Morocco to Iraq in the Palestinian situation. I mean, I understand what, your argument about the great and the powerful, 
perhaps is, is important, and I, I agreed in the beginning that the international community of the United States is certainly, uh, you know, culpable in this situation, but I think it can't be absolutely universal. This is silly. The African peoples felt a particular responsibility to address the apartheid regime in South Africa. When, you know, in, in, in all of these colonial situations, peoples whose identity are close to the victims, this comes out. I really don't expect the villagers of some mountaintop in Bolivia to have the same attitude right. uh, on this conflict we're talking as, as, about people, government. as the Arabs. We're talking okay. about governments, okay. not I think we've citizens in Bolivia. Well, exactly. Let me take a question from the lady in the second row. This is for um, this side of the panel. I mean, um, the, the saying goes, keep your friends close but enemies closer. I don't see how you can find a resolution for the Palestinian people by just cutting all your relations with the Israelis. And you... you, you Pardon? Cutting, cutting oh, relations. Right, right, right. Yeah, by boycotting them, you know. First of all, if you're just looking at the Arab world, we don't make half the population. If you're right. looking at the Muslim world, that doesn't just incorporate the Arab world. Second of all, um, you, you talk about self-criticism. If there's anybody in the Arab government that we need to criticize, it's the BLO. Had they been clear and transparent, like the, yeah. the states, for example, we donated, um, the, uh, the Arab countries have donated a lot of money. That's because there's a transparent system where we can communicate with. The PLO, who do you go to and where do you go? Hmm. Yeah. The, yeah. You, you yeah. first. Okay. Yes, yeah. Kata, look, I, <coughs> I Look, I, this, this is, I keep hearing this from various people. So please answer the, it. The PLO... <laughs> the P, well, well, allow me to answer it. The, P, the PLO and the guess. Palestinian leadership and many things about the Palestinians can be criticized. There is no doubt about it. Nevertheless, we are here to discuss the role of Arab governments. And in reality, you talk about not isolating Israel. You know, I have to tell you, I disagree with you. If the policy had been to isolate Israel wholeheartedly and properly from the beginning, and it had continued, it would have been highly effective. I think we need to agree that Israel is not the friend of the Arab people, not just the Palestinians. It's not a friend of the Arabs. We need to understand this. Therefore, we have to actually find the best method to deal with it. We, now, you may think it's through having relations. I, I happen to think that if you can isolate it, but isolate it not half-heartedly as the Arabs have done, Arab governments, boycotts in reality, behind the scenes. In reality, we don't have relations with Israel. Behind the scenes, we have all kinds of secret meetings. If you do things properly, then you actually achieve results. The gentleman's been waiting up there a long time. Can we get a microphone My to question you? is for uh, Ghada Karmi. So are you asking us to isolate the entire Arab world to re-isolate itself from Israel the only, uh, and then again isolate itself from the only existing superpower in the world? Mm. How risky is that for us? Yeah, well, of course it's risky. Of course, of course, it's, it's too late now. It's too late. And of course, my point is So you're all not along, asking for that now? No, I was, I'm, I was answering her that actually isolating Israel would have been extremely successful if it had been done consistently and properly from the beginning. But I actually take your point. That is one of the things that I, it is very depressing about all this, is that the fact is you have got this one superpower. The fact is that the Arabs made a strategic decision not to challenge either Israel or the superpower, to remain, for Arab governments to remain in power by virtue of American favor and American support, very often, not all of them, but very often, they made that decision. As a result, once you've got that sort of relationship, there is actually, you have no room for maneuver. You have to obey orders. All right, so I'm going to take another question from a gentleman up there who's been waiting a long time. You, sir. Um, my question is directed to Mr. Tarazi. Isn't the fact that Palestinians have been living in refugee camps for over 50 years now enough evidence to say that the Arab governments have let down the Palestinians? No. Uh, first of all, Jordan, I think, is the only country in the world that has ever taken in such huge numbers of refugees from neighboring countries and given them equal rights. I don't think you're going to find any place in the world that opens its doors up to refugees and automatically grants them citizenship. It doesn't happen anywhere, but it did happen in the Arab world with respect to Jordan. I'm not saying that Lebanon and Syria are justified in their treatment, but to extrapolate from Lebanon and Syria, and then say the entire Arab world has failed the Palestinians, I think is simply unfair. But Michael knows very well what the questioner is talking about. He's saying the Arab states didn't do anything in all those years to try and get those people, either give to, to treat them as in, in decently, 
or to allow them to return to their country. In, they in, never in did Jordan, either. In Jordan, they're in, not treated I'll tell you. I'll tell you about Jordan. If you stress me, Jordan took in the Palestinians for a very good reason, and they gave them citizenship for a good reason, and it was nothing to do, or and, very little to do, and, with being uh, generous right. and humane. It was to do with building up Jordan, which right. was a tiny country with a tiny population, right. and I'm afraid and it's else, cynical, and, but it's and true. And where else in the world have you seen a country like Jordan take in a majority of refugees of its population? Because there's no other country I can think of like Jordan, which had a, virtu a minuscule population where, where, and was what desperate other, to form itself. What other country has taken in that many refugees, uh, period? Look, you know, it's fine. Jordan uh, deserves some praise, and Great. in this context, Egypt, some praise in some other context that you mentioned before. No Great. one is sitting here saying no and Arabs. Kuwait. Hold on, no Arabs. Oh, the, the history of Kuwait on this score is not one to be trumpeting. Uh, well, but, uh, then you're ignoring uh, you know, the, the early uh, years in which a huge number of Palestinians were. Well, there, there was this minor including matter. My of, there was this minor matter of 1991, 92. Sure, so, yeah. so, so mm -hmm. let's let's but let's concentrate on the big picture. Uh, uh, bottom bottom line is, I think there's a lot of truth to what the questioner said. And here, I think you have to go that, uh, and, and certainly a number of Arab states and a good deal of the Palestinian leadership over the years had preferred for with the public logic being the one uh, that the foreign minister here has mentioned that this, uh, you know, not to keep people in refugee camps essentially would be to play into the hands of Israel. But I think there was a calculation that keeping people poor and miserable and angry would somehow be a good thing for the movement. And I don't think that's been the case. And if, okay. if you don't think this was a matter of policy, both Arab mm -hmm. and Palestinian, you're yeah. very you want, naive. Do you want to just answer that no, quickly? I, I think you're wrong. You're taking Lebanon and Syria and you're whitewashing the entire Arab world and you're guilty of the I'm same not, sign of generalization that the making, Israelis are. I'm making okay. an exception for All right, Jordan. Let's repeat that. Lady in yeah, white. Please. On the Especially since it's so silly. Mr. Michael Tarazi, you keep saying that the Arab governments are not the only ones to blame, but the question is whether they are to blame or not. Right, and, and I agree with you. And so if you take a look at what they were able to do, which was the second point of my discussion, in terms of military capacity, what they actually tried to do, in terms of economically with the oil embargo, in terms of the diplomatically and recently as 2002, oh. to say that they haven't done anything and they have failed the Palestinians, with, I mean, let's be Perfect serious. Example. The Arabs you know, are not a diplomatic, the, the economic oil, the oil you know, embargo powerhouse can he, can he in just the finish? world. Oh, yeah, can he just finish? You know, we, are, we are not a military superpower. So given the limitations that we have to work under, let's not pretend we're superheroes. Given the limitations that we have, we have done the best we can. Oh, and to please. blame them for that, I think, is very oh, unfair. Please. This is the best. Okay, okay. The oil embargo, okay, perfect case. Just a very brief per point Perfect here. case in point. It achieved absolutely nothing except making most ordinary Americans believe that Arabs, uh, Saudis, uh, and, and people in the Gulf were criminals ripping them off. Did zero to help the Palestinians and actually covered up the fact that U.S. oil companies were responsible for raising the price of oil. Okay. It was insane. Gen okay. Gentlemen in the fifth row I mean, up if there. you want a failure, that's the grandest Thank failure you. you could ever imagine. Thank you very much. Gentlemen Sorry. in the fifth row. I don't understand why uh, diplomatic inroads are being uh, so so neglected. I mean, is, I mean, when we call for isolation and whatnot, that's, that's prelude to more often than not war. I mean, you, yeah. you cited uh, Iraq as putting it in isolation, but you've seen what's happened there. And then you expect to isolate Israel, a nuclear power, and hope that it just reacts well. No. I don't see how that, uh, it, it, in, in the entire Arab world, only two countries, Jordan and Egypt, making uh, diplomatic uh, gestures towards, towards Israel, both heavily dependent on U.S. foreign aid, can be cited as, as Credible examples when the rest of the world should be, uh, the rest of the Arab world should follow suit. Mm. Look, it's too late. I, I, I said it's too late actually now to isolate it. It's too late. The opportunity was missed. But if you break off relations or if you withdraw your ambassadors, as, as in, in fact, Egypt has done that, it actually sends a signal. It sends a signal to the Palestinians who are dying under Israeli bombs that actually somebody cares about You're them. You're saying it's too that, late, but you still want a signal sent. No, no, no. I'm I, talking I, about an isolation of Israel. Uh, but he, two issues he talked about. Isolating Israel and the other was cutting off relations or withdrawing or cutting off diplomatic relations. It actually does send a signal, which I think is quite important. It is much better to empower the Palestinians who have an elected leadership that for the first time in a long time is pursuing a plausible diplomatic strategy. They need aid in the form of billions. And the present day scandal, the scandal of du jour, the scandal of the moment, is that billions are not flowing into Gaza right now to support President Abbas. I think we've uh, <laughs> run out of time on the questions and we come to that point in the proceedings where we're going to vote on the motion that this House believes that Arab governments have failed the Palestinians. Yes. Would you please take your voting devices 
You press 1 if you are for the motion, you press 2 if you're against, and would you please do that now? You only need to press once, you don't continually need to press just once, and we'll get the results very quickly. The vote is coming up now, we'll see it any moment now, and it looks as if the motion has been carried resoundingly. 72.3 for the motion and 27.7 against. It's been carried decisively. Thank you very much. So, for now, it just remains for me to thank the audience for coming and our distinguished panelists, of course. We'll be back in November. Join us then. For now, have a safe journey home. Thank you and good night.